I'll start right in and uh, just note in this talk, I isolate Anselm's argument for the existence of God from its context and its motive. The context, which is prayer, and the motive, which is faith seeking understanding, have to be taken into consideration to appreciate Anselm's intention as a whole. But in isolating his argument for consideration, I am not alone. Philosophers from the medieval period through Descartes, Spinoza, and Leibniz, all three of whom wrote their own versions of the argument, and right into the 20th century, have argued, excuse me, have isolated Anselm's arguments, which came to be known as the ontological argument. And they expect, inspected it for validity and soundness. Of course, not all have been persuaded. Thomas Aquinas and Kant, as we shall see, held the ontological argument to be defective though on quite different grounds. Others, some of them professed non-believers, have admired it. The young Bertrand Russell, who was one of the half dozen greatest logicians of all time, whatever his other merits, and who was certainly no theist, on initially taking a look at the argument, dismissed it as many people do with a laugh. It is reported that sometime afterwards, while walking down the street filling his pipe, Russell suddenly stopped in mid-stride, threw the can of tobacco into the air and shouted, great God in boots, the ontological argument is sound. Mm -hmm. yeah. Russell moderated that assessment later, but he remained haunted by the argument. Late in life, he is supposed to have said that we know intuitively that there's just something has to be wrong with the ontological argument, <clears throat> but saying that there has to be something wrong with the ontological argument, but saying precisely what is wrong with it is no easy matter. Russell's reaction is a common one, dismissal with laughter, then astonishment, then something like resignation, either a more or less reluctant acknowledgement the argument is compelling or a discomforting sense that though there has to be something wrong with it, it's not sufficiently clear what this something is. Kurt Gödel, another great 20th century logician, thought the ontological argument, argument in its essentials was sound. His posthumous papers contain a reworking and refinement of the ontological argument in the symbology of 20th century argument. Gödel's version of the argument is currently being studied, argued for, argued against by thinkers working in the analytic tradition. Those hard-headed, steely-eyed folks who are more interested in proofs than in books, even great books. Apropos of which, it is the reputation of Anselm at St. John's that led me to think that giving a talk on him here might be worthwhile. For in 30, 40 odd years of teaching, uh, off and on. I've heard sophomores and now and then sophomore seminar tutors as well say Anselm's argument is just stupid. Why do we waste our time reading such nonsense? Now I realize that a number of tutors and students do respect Anselm's argument and occasionally some very fine sophomore and senior essays get written on it. But the argument deserves more respect than it usually receives here given the intellectual acumen of the thinkers who over the centuries since it was composed have found something in it worthy of close engagement. Some elementary logic here. All arguments, demonstrations, or proofs make use of premises, the ultimate premises being indemonstrable, either because they are mere hypotheses or because they're plausible but still uncertain, uncertain or because they're self-evident truths. On the, premise, on the basis of premises, conclusions are inferred by rules of inference or deduction, many but not all of which Aristotle presents in the prior analytics. An argument should be inspected first with a view to determining whether or not it is formally valid. Does the conclusion follow necessarily from the premises? If so, the argument is by definition valid whether the premises are true or not. The next matter to be determined is whether the argument is sound. If the argument is valid, and if additionally the premises are true, then the argument is sound and the conclusion is true. If the premises are known to be true, then the conclusion validly inferred from them is known to be true demonstrably true as well. Let us now turn to Anselm's argument uh, in chapter two of the Prologion and try to determine first whether it is valid and if so second whether it is sound. The argument is concise. In fact, it is a bit too concise. In the interest of dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's, I illustrate Anselm's argument in a sequence of syllogisms which are contained in the handout. I depart slightly from the order of Anselm's own presentation. So this is number one on your handout, I think. Yes, that's right. Let me get this in front of me so I can make sure that it's coordinated with what you have. So God is something then which nothing can be thought. So excuse me, nothing greater can be thought. God is something then which nothing greater can be thought. First from the second witness, something then which nothing greater can be thought cannot exist in the mind alone. Therefore, God cannot exist in the mind alone. 
I should be calling this syllogism the first syllogism to distinguish it from the other syllogisms that are numbered on the handout. I've underlined the middle term of the syllogism, something then which nothing greater can be thought, because it is what connects the first premise with the second premise. The middle term disappears in the conclusion. The second syllogism is the form of Anselm's syllogism. A is B, B is C, therefore A is C. That's the basic structure. The syllogism is obviously valid, this one, number two, chiefly because B, the middle term, is by the self-evident principle of identity, the same B in both the first premise and the second premise. In this connection, I note that the principles of non-contradiction of the excluded middle and identity are held to be logically equivalent by most contemporary logicians. This equivalence can be shown by truth tables. Still, I think that, I think that the principle of identity properly understood is the more fundamental of the three. For as I understand this principle, it means not just that a proposition P, but even the term of a proposition, for example, B in the second syllogism, retains its identity in multiple iterations. And this identity of terms and propositions is presupposed by the principles of non-contradiction in the excluded middle. That's the reason why I think the principle of identity has a priority. In the case of terms as abstract and simple as B, there is no room, so to speak, for equivocation. But with less abstract and simple terms, equivocation can occur. When that happens in an argument, we get a paralogism. Consider syllogism three. Clothes can be packed in a trunk. A trunk is an elephant snout. Clothes can be packed in an elephant snout. The last syllogism is obviously invalid for it turns fallaciously on an equivocation in the use of the middle term trunk. Not all, so, all paralogisms are so easy to spot. But in the various criticisms of Anselm's argument that I have read, I've never seen it described as a paralogism, nor do I see any reason to suspect that it is a paralogism. <clears throat> so until and unless someone shows otherwise, I shall declare the first syllogism to be formally valid, just like the second syllogism, but not the third syllogism. In the first syllogism, like the second syllogism, the conclusion follows of necessity, to use Aristotle's expression, from the premises. That is to say, if one grants the premises, one cannot avoid granting the conclusion. The wording in the first syllogism can be slightly tweaked so that the connective verb in the second premise and in the conclusion uh, agrees with the connecting verb in the major premise. In the fourth syllogism, on your handout, I tweak as follows. God is something then which nothing greater can be thought. Something then which nothing greater can be thought is something that cannot exist in the mind alone. Therefore, God is something that cannot exist in the mind alone. I reword Anselm's argument this way just to show that those who are sensitive to rigor, that we can, in fact, get the copula is in both premises and the conclusion. This is a trivial matter, however, nothing particularly significant is gained by the rewording. So for simplicity's sake, I shall stay with the first syllogism in the handout rather than the fourth syllogism. You will note that the first syllogism does not conclude with the assertion that God exists, but only with the assertion that God cannot exist in the mind alone. So we need a follow-up syllogism which is the fifth syllogism on your handout. Whatever exists in the mind, but cannot exist in the mind alone, exists in reality as well. I call that as an axiom. Whatever exists in the mind, but cannot exist in the mind alone, exists in reality as well. God exists in the mind, but God cannot exist in the mind alone. That's the conclusion of the first syllogism. Therefore, God exists in reality. I call the first premise in this syllogism an axiom because it is uncontroversial, it should be. By saying that something exists in reality, I mean that it would exist even if we did not think about it. Whether it would exist if God did not think about it is another question, but one that I shall not address in this talk. <laughs> now, the fifth syllogism is valid as well. There's nothing wrong with the logical form of the argument, assuming, of course, that it is not a paralogism. But repeat, the formal validity of an argument does not suffice for proving the conclusion. Additionally, the premises must be true. So let us turn now from the question of validity to the question of soundness focusing on the premises of the first syllogism. For though the fifth syllogism uh, reaches a much stronger conclusion than the first, it is only an extension of the first syllogism through the employment of an uncontroversial axiom. So to the uh, first premise in investigating the question of soundness, God is something then which nothing greater can be thought. The word something in this proposition is neutral. It does not imply existence. A little later on, Anselm will use the equally neutral expression that, than which nothing greater can be thought. He is careful not to speak of God here as a being, 
than which nothing greater can be thought, or as a thing than which nothing greater can be thought, since doing so could appear to beg the question from the outset uh, by stating that God exists before the conclusion is reached. By the way, one thing, if you don't get anything from this, uh, please uh, take to heart my admonition against using the expression to beg the question is a fancy way of saying to raise the question. It's not that at all. To beg the question means to assume what it is you're trying to prove. It has a specific meaning in logic. To beg the question the way we're using it today sounds like a fancy way of saying to raise the question, but it's kind of ignorant, so don't do it. <laughs> okay, soundness. Uh, in this connection, uh, yeah, tell me. Okay, now this first premise could look like a definition. God is that in which nothing greater can be thought, but a typical definition locates what's being defined in a class and then specifies what is being defined as a member of that class. In fact, in a typical definition, it is a class that's being defined. A species is defined in terms of the genus to which it belongs and in terms of the specific difference that distinguishes it from other species belonging to that genus. Man, for example, is a species that is defined in terms of genus of the genus animal to which it belongs and in terms of the specific difference, rational, that distinguish it from other animals. The first premise in Anselm's argument, God is something than which nothing greater cannot be thought, excuse me, God is something than which a greater cannot be thought, or that than which nothing greater can be thought, is then not a typical definition, but the subject God is not a species as man is. Indeed, as we shall see, an upshot of Anselm's argument is God is a, so to speak, he's in a class by himself. We might take the word something in the predicate to name a genus, but doing so would be forced since the word is so broad, as is the word that, and the expression Anselm uses a little, a little bit later, that than which nothing greater can be thought. The phrase than which nothing greater can be thought could look like a specific difference. What distinguishes this particular something God from other somethings? But I think it makes most sense to construe the first premise simply as stating what, or at least part of what, Anselm uh, and other intelligent Catholics mean by the word God. Part of what they mean by it, not all of what they mean by it, by a long shot, but it's essential to what they mean by it. And something then which nothing greater can be thought is not only what Anselm means by the word God, it is also what his opponent is going to have to mean by the word God if he's going to disagree with Anselm. Meaningful disagreement about the existence or non-existence of something presupposes agreement of how that something is to be understood. One might say in objection to the first premise in Anselm's argument, what you, Anselm, call God is not what I call God. To this objection, Anselm could easily respond, no problem, I'll use another expression for what I call God. What I call God, I'll now call something greater than any other being possible or actual. The proof still works. To see how this modification still results in, a proof, results in a proof that works for Anselm, we substitute the expression something greater than any other being possible or actual for God in the first syllogism, we get the following, which is the sixth syllogism in your handout. Something greater than any other being possible or actual is something than which nothing greater can be thought. Something than which nothing greater can be thought cannot exist in the mind alone. Therefore, something than any other being greater than any other being possible or actual cannot exist in the mind alone. The conclusion of this syllogism, the sixth syllogism, is as strong as the conclusion of the first syllogism. We can continue by substituting the expression something that is greater than any other being possible or actual for God in the fifth syllogism, and we get the conclusion something greater than any other possible being um, or actual being exists in reality, which is as strong as the conclusion of the first syllogism. So Anselm's proof does not require him to use the word God. However, he is justified in doing so. This being then which nothing greater can be thought, whose real and not just mental existence, Anselm thinks he has proven, must possess all possible perfections. With this being possessed only some possible perfection, then something could be thought that would be greater than it, namely something possessing all possible perfections. And this something would be more properly called God. It should be obvious, moreover, that to be the only being that possesses all possible perfections is to be greater than to be one among several who might be thought to possess all possible perfections. Additionally, if there were two or more beings possessing all possible perfections, there would be no way in which they could differ from one another. And so it follows that there can be only one being that is that then which nothing greater can be thought. So passing all other beings possible or actual is itself a perfection, albeit only an eminence. So again, there can be only one being that possesses all possible perfections. 
in sum, since something uniquely possessing all possible perfections is that than which nothing greater can be thought, and since it, is, since it is precisely this being whose existence Anselm's argument has purportedly demonstrated, he is fully entitled to call it God, whatever other people happen to call by God, by the word God. One wishes to argue effectively against Anselm, one cannot do so by saying, what you, Anselm, call God is not what I call God. For Anselm would respond, if what you mean by God is a very large, invisible, man-like being with a long white beard sitting on a cloud somewhere, occasionally hurling thunderbolts down at human beings, I never set out to prove the existence of such a being. I set out to prove the existence of something absolutely supreme. And that means supreme not in the sense of the greatest thing that just happens to exist, or well, one might think that the greatest thing that happens to exist in the visible cosmos uh, or its underlying material, the greatest thing that happens to exist, one might think, is the visible cosmos or its underlying material or the United Nations or Socrates or something else comparably grand. But by absolutely supreme, I and some mean greatest possible. God is that in which a greater cannot in principle be thought. I and some proof in the existence of such a being who is unsurpassable, who cannot be equaled by any other being possible or actual. I and some hold that a Catholic must believe at least this much about God, whatever in addition he may, by appeal to revelation, also believe about God. One might object to Anselm's first premise and to the second as well by taking issue with the word greater. The word is, one might say, ambiguous. Anselm would respond as follows. The word greater is not ambiguous to me, and I doubt it is not greater to you either. All other things being equal, intelligence and knowledge are greater than or superior to stupidity and ignorance. Strength is greater than or superior to weakness. The capacity to produce is greater than or superior to the past capacity to be produced only. To be able to produce without having to make use of pre-existing material, that is to create ex nihilo, is greater than or superior to having make use, to make use of pre-existing material. To be free with respect to at least some things is greater than or superior to being necessitated with respect to all things. To be for all eternity is greater than or superior to coming into existence and or passing out of existence uh, from time to time. To owe one's existence to nothing else is greater than or superior to owing one ex one's existence to something else. To be one of a kind while possessing all these excellences is greater than or superior to being a member of a class in which all the other members possess them to the same degree. And finally, for something that possesses all these essences and more to exist in reality is greater, superior to existing in the human mind alone. These are things that I and some have in mind when I think of greatness and I'm willing to argue for them, but you will notice that my argument does not bring all, does not bring in all these things. It does presuppose that something could be thought to be greater than something else. If you deny that, then my argument will indeed be lost on you. The second premise <clears throat> sound is something then which nothing greater can be thought cannot exist in the mind alone would be objected to by someone who holds that whatever one thinks of is by that very fact in the mind. Such a person holds that we cannot think of anything existing outside the mind. But of course we can. If we could not do so, we could not even make sense of the distinction between in the mind on the one hand and outside the mind or in reality on the other. And yet one has to make this very distinction even to say that whatever we're thinking of is thereby only in the mind. Moreover, if this objection were really on target, it would follow that God has every bit as much reality as anything else we can conceive, since all these things and anything else we can conceive of are, as this criticism alleges, only in the mind, and thereby on the same footing as regards their existence. Consequently, this line of attack, that whatever you think of is, all, 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 is only in your mind, would prove the opposite of what it contends. Anselm quite sensibly holds that virtually anything we can think of as existing in our minds, we can also think of as existing outside our minds. The chief exception being the very operations of the mind, such things as thinking, remembering, anticipating, perceiving, feeling, desiring, and so forth. We can also think of things as existing outside the, outside the mind, even while momentarily coordinated with the mind. I can think, for example, of my automobile as being parked in a parking lot outside this building and not just inside my mind, much less inside my brain, whatever an automobile inside a brain might be thought to mean. The act of thinking, the act of thinking is to be sure a mental event. That does not certainly by itself cause what is thought about to be a mental event as well. Though one hears this claim often enough. 
to attack the second premise on the grounds that we cannot think of anything without it thereby being in the mind is false to the experience, indeed to the very sense of thinking, perceiving, remembering, and even imagining, as I think, by the way, Husserl demonstrates. The second premise in the first syllogism does, however, need to be significantly qualified. Doing so entails this consequent diminution in the force of the conclusion. I would reformulate it, and this is number seven. God is something than which nothing greater can be thought. Something than which nothing greater can be thought cannot be thought of as existing in the mind alone. Therefore, God cannot be thought of as existing in the mind alone. That's a more, that's a, a, a softer, milder premise, uh, excuse me, conclusion. From this conclusion, we infer further by means of the previous reasoning, therefore God must be thought of as existing in reality. To the objection of Gonalo that a perfect island or any other entity in addition to God that we might think of as perfect would by Anselm's reasoning also have to exist necessarily, we have to ask what a perfect island could be considered to be. Gonalo suggests that it would have more riches and delights than other islands, but why stop there? Quite apart from the fact that another island with even more riches and delights could be conceived, would a perfect island be larger in size with higher mountains and more numerous rivers than any other possible island? Would it be infinite in size? Would it support life for all possible species and for innumerable member, members of those species? Would it be so constituted that waves did not gnaw away at its shores? Would it never rain on this perfect island or do so every five days or how often? Or would it produce moisture on its own without having to rely on an external cause like rain? Would it be near to or far from other islands and by exactly how much? Would a perfect island be able to move from place to place, levitate and fly about? Could a perfect island be eternal? Would it be able to create other islands ex nihilo? Would a perfect island be aware that it was an island? Would it be omnipotent? Would it possess free will? These questions lead us to see that an absolutely perfect island, one surpassing and unequal by any other islands actual or possible, is in fact a contradiction in terms, precisely because it has to be conceived of as finite, if only in space, in order as finite can always be surpassed. The same is true of anything other than God that is misconstrued as perfect without qualification. Some 20th century positivist critics of Anselm's argument following the lead of Kant, who in fact going beyond him, boldly assert that exists reality and existing reality are strictly speaking meaningless expressions. Some assertions, uh, such assertions are as lame as they are arbitrary, for we all know what is meant by the following three sentences. Extraterrestrial life is not just a fiction. Extraterrestrial life does not exist just in the mind. It exists in reality as well, namely on Mars. These sentences may well be false, of course, but they're not simply meaningless. Otherwise, we could not understand them, and we can't. By the way, if they were meaningless, they'd be neither true nor false. Indeed, we have to understand what is meant by the expression exists in order to, to argue that extraterrestrial life does not exist or even is unlikely to exist on Mars. Similarly, when an, an atheist says that God does not exist or that exists in the mind but not in reality, we understand what he is saying also. What he says, whether true or false, is meaningful. The dispute, the dispute between the atheist and theist would not be meaningful if words like, like exist, reality, and existing reality were themselves meaningless. And this dispute between the two is not meaningless. When Kant is speaking carefully, he says that existence is not a real predicate. That's his, his, his uh, considered language. A real predicate is one that determines the subject qualitatively. Since for Kant, we have theoretical knowledge as distinct from practical, practical knowledge only of appearances, leaving to one side the deeply interesting question of the epistemic character of the critiques themselves, real property means for Kant bound up with the qualitative features of a possible perception, such as color and sound. Kant's objection to considering existence as a predicate is then tied to specific features of his general critique of pure reason. About that more shortly. For now, let us imagine the following disputation between Anselm and his opponent. Opponent, I don't care how tight your argument appears to be, even if I can't say where it short, falls short, I'm certain that there's something wrong with it. You can't just prove the existence of God by manipulating concepts and moving words around. Anselm, yes, you can, and I just did it. <laughs> but, if it can't, but it can't be that easy to prove the existence of God, something the greatest minds have disagreed about for millennia. And so, as a matter of belief, I accept the statement in Genesis that we human beings are made in the image of God. And I accept the words of the psalmist, the light of thy countenance hath been signed upon us, O Lord. 
God has made us so that we can know by means of our natural reason, so that we do not just have to take it on faith that he exists. There should be nothing surprising about this. Well, just what I suspected all along, you're saying all these things only because you're already a believer. In fact, before advancing your so-called proof, you pray to God to give you understanding. You present your quasi-definition by saying, credimos, we believe thee to be something then which nothing greater can be thought. You're only pretending to be advancing an argument on the basis of reason alone, but with your we believe, you tip your hand. Your whole proof presupposes belief. And so the expression presupposes belief is ambiguous. I already had faith, truth. That's why I was praying. But what I was praying for was understanding. This is a case of fides, fides querens intellectum, not a fides querens uh, maiorum fidem, faith seeking uh, understanding, not faith seeking more faith. I was praying for an airtight proof that God really exists and that he exists in a way that is fully compatible with what we Catholics believe about him. God granted my prayer. He showed me a proof. I was indeed motivated by faith and I indeed believed that I was guided by God to the understanding that I have reached but neither my belief nor God's guidance are logical premises of my proof. I present the proof to believers and unbelievers alike for inspection in terms of natural reason alone. What motivated me to seek the proof and how I came to, by the insight to achieve the proof, interesting though these matters are to me especially, nonetheless lie outside the proof itself. I desire to prove that God exists and I believe that God strengthened my intellect, not my faith merely, so that I could discover the proof. My situation is not really different from Euclid's. He probably desired to prove that the base angles of isosceles triangles are equal, and I believe that God helped him do this. But Euclid's desire, and whatever divine assistance he may or may not have received from coming up with his proof, does not figure into our evaluation of the proof as it stands. And so I ask you to evaluate, evaluate my argument as it stands, and not belittle or dismiss it simply because it has been advanced by a believing Catholic. If you will evaluate my argument as stand, you will see that I have proven the existence of a being of such greatness that his non-existence cannot even be entertained without a contradiction emerging immediately. Opponent, you are saying that I cannot even conceive of the non-existence of God, but I can. With Gonalu, I too can appeal to Scripture as an authority for my claim that the non-existence of God can be conceived. In Scripture, it says, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And so true, the fool has indeed said this, but that is only because he is a fool. Now that's what Anselm says. It's not what I say for reasons I shall give shortly. Before doing so, however, we need to consider a different, more sophisticated line of criticism, that's Kant's. Against Anselm, one can argue that just because we must think of God as existing in reality, it does not follow that he does in fact exist in reality. We cannot infer so confidently from how we must think to how things must be, that is be in themselves. We are vulnerable to a dialectical illusion when we do this, particularly so if we're speaking of a being that could not be given in a possible spatial and temporal experience. Kant, who makes this argument, does not unfortunately address <coughs> Anselm's actual language and reasoning in his famous treatment of the ontological argument of critique of pure reason. In fact, we cannot be sure that he even knew of Anselm's original version, version of the argument. And Kant addresses only Descartes' version and modifications of it, and, uh, moreover, the consensus of Descartes scholars today is that Descartes was not familiar, Descartes himself was not familiar with Anselm's argument, at least not as Anselm articulated it. Here's how Descartes' argument is sometimes expressed more or less syllogistically. I'll bet eighth, your eighth syllogism. God construed as the supreme being has all perfections, existence is a perfection, therefore God has existence. Descartes actual argument meditation five, I shall not speak to his first argument uh, for the existence of God in meditation three. His actual argument in meditation five is a little different. Here's a condensation. I cannot think of a mountain without thinking of a valley. That is what a mountain is next to. It could be a plain as well as a valley or just the base of the mountain. In any case, I cannot think of a mountain without thinking of it as towering over something. In the same way, I cannot think of something as defi defined as possessing all perfections without thinking of it as existing. This is how Descartes concludes his argument. I cannot think of God except as existing. Therefore, it follows that existence is inseparable from him and therefore that he really exists. The first therefore in this passage is questionable. To repeat, it might be the case that though I cannot think of God except as existing, he still might not really exist. And that's Kant's objection. Kant's criticism of the ontological argument is by far the best known and most influential. He wishes to show that human reason by its very nature seeks to know certain things that also by its very nature it cannot know. It seeks the unconditioned. 
This, according to Kant, is simply how reason functions. So he does not regard arguments for the existence of God as arising primarily out of an unwillingness to face up to finitude, anxiety, and terror in the face of the abyss, deluded hopes, loneliness, just needing someone to love or be loved by or any other such thing. Arguments for the existence of God arise primarily out of reasons, natural quest, the quest intrinsic to what it is, for an unconditioned ground of all that is conditioned. Kant sees at least that much. In the earlier parts of the critique, the transcendental aesthetic, the transcendental analytic, Kant tries to show that our cognitive apparatus yields knowledge indeed, but only of what is in space and time, or what can be presented in space and time, which is to say objects of a possible experience. Aside from formal logic and mathematics, and also aside from the principles of theoretical and practical reason, we can have knowledge only of appearances as distinct from whatever it may be that underlies them. In the transcendental dialectic, Kant tries to show that and how human reason goes astray when it attempts to answer the questions dealt with by classical metaphysics, which at his time was divided into general <coughs> um, metaphysics and special metaphysics, general metaphysics or rational ontology, attempted to answer the question, what is being? And Kant tells us, quote, the proud name of, of an ontology, which presumes to offer synthetic a priori cognitions of things in general, must give way to a mere analytic or pure understanding. Special metaphysics was divided into rational psychology, rational cosmology, and rational theology, and had as its concern, respectively, the human soul as possibly immortal, the limits and condition of the world taken as a whole, and God. In the Critique of Pure Reason, Kant tries to show that reason necessarily goes astray when it tries to make definitive pronouncements about these things. He attempts to expose the confusions in which reason gets tangled up, and to do so without appeal to what he has established earlier in the critique. He afterwards attempts to resolve these confusions precisely by appeal to what he has established earlier in the critique. It is in that way that Kant envisions the transcendental dialectic to serve as an independent confirmation of the earlier claims in the transcendental aesthetic and the transcendental analytic, as distinct from a mere reiteration and elaboration. Kant is relatively successful, in my opinion, in relying on not relying, excuse me, Kant is relatively successful in not relying on the earlier parts of the critique in the sections entitled Paralogisms of Pure Reason and the Antinomy of Pure Reason, where he attempts to show respectively that what at first appears to be a strong argument for the immortality of the soul confuses the soul with the unifying principle at work in the act of thinking, and that contradictory arguments about the limits and condition of the world are as a whole valid but unsound. But in the ideal of pure reason, where he tries to show what is wrong with all proofs for the existence of God, which he says reduced explicitly or implicitly to the ontological argument, his criticism appeals to his own account of the nature of concepts in general, and pure concepts in particular, as presented in the first part of the critique. I quote a passage with some interspersed commentary that bears this out it's from the introductory section of the ideal. The Kant, we have seen above, that is in the transcendental analytic, that no objects can be represented through pure concepts of the understanding, such as cause and effect, apart from the conditions of sensibility. But eyes, ideas such as the unconditioned, God in particular, are even further removed from objective reality than are categories or pure concepts, for no appearance can be found in which they can be represented in the concrete. Well, without ref reference to what can appear in space and time, the concept of causality, according to Kant, has no legitimate application. Unlike Hume and in response to him, Kant argues that the concept of causality has an altogether justifiable employment with respect to what can appear in space and time. An object of knowledge can be known as distinct from merely thought through the concept of causality only if this concept is invested with a spatial and especially a temporal sense. According to Kant, the idea of something unconditioned, for example, the free will, cannot be investigated, cannot be invested with a spatial or temporal sense. For as he sees it, the free will, if it exists, is outside space and time and hence outside appearances, which he argues are governed by exceptionist, determin <coughs> exceptionist determinism. But because the spatial temporal order is not all there is, freedom of the will is at least thinkable as a thing in itself, though not as a known object of our finite knowledge. Pure concepts cannot yield knowledge except under the conditions of sensibility. And one class of pure concept, what he calls with reference to Plato, ideas, because they pertain to something unconditioned, cannot yield knowledge at all. But now Kant introduces something new, neither a pure concept nor an idea, but what he calls the ideal. Quote, 
What I entitle the ideal seems to be even further removed from objective reality than the ideal. By the ideal, I understand the idea not merely in concreto, but in individual, the ideal as an individual being. Well, the ideal of pure reason is in fact the concept of God. If the argument of the transcendental analytic is sound, no knowledge of God is possible, though belief in God is possible, and for, God, for Kant cannot be undermined by anything we're able to know definitively. The question to keep in mind in assessing Kant's criticism of the ontological argument is then whether his criticism logically presupposes the, trend, presupposes the transcendental analytic, so that for someone to concur in this criticism, he has to accept the chief claims, at least, of the transcendental aesthetic and the transcendental analytic. I'll give a quotation here from Kant. A concept is always possible if it is not self-contradictory. This is the logical criterion, the logical criterion of possibility, but it may nonetheless be an empty concept unless the objective reality of the synthesis through which the concept is generated has been specified. And such a proof, as we have shown above in the, in the analytic, rests on principles of possible experience, end quote. Kant's very notion of possibility is shaped by what he argues for in the transcendental analytic. Nonetheless, he tries to set this notion aside and attack the ontological argument from another side. Kant again. There's a contradiction in introducing the concept of existence into the concept of a thing that we profess to be thinking solely in reference to its possibility. I'll read Kant's criticism again. It's interesting. There's a contradiction in in introducing the concept of existence into the concept of the thing that we profess to be thinking, at least at first, only in reference to its possibility. The proponent of the ontological argument would say that Kant's objection here surely holds of contingent things, of things that need not be. It does not, however, hold of a necessary thing, about thing that when we think of it solely in reference to its possibility, we suddenly discover we cannot think of only this way, but must also think of as actual, indeed, as necessary too. Introducing the concept of existence, as Kant puts it, is indeed odd or remarkable, and certainly an exception to the way we conceive of everything other than God. That is, the concept of existence is not intrinsic to the concept of the existence of any spatial temporal things, where all such beings are contingent, if only in the sense that we can think of them without contradiction as not existing. We can think of such things, we can even say with some precision what they are without having to, without, without having to say that they are. But there's nothing contradictory whatsoever about saying that the concept of existence is intrinsic to the concept of a necessary being. Indeed, unless the concept of a necessary being is itself contradictory or meaningless, we have to say that the concept of existence is intrinsic to the very concept of a necessary being. By the way, Kant himself postulates that God exists in the critique of practical reason. So if, unless he thinks God's existence is contingent, which is strange, he has to think of God's existence as necessary, which means pertaining to God's very concept. So the criticism that he advances late in the critique of pure reason uh, doesn't affect what he says about God as a postulate, not as something we can know late in the critique of practical reason. To understand Kant's position, we must note that he makes a distinction between intuitions, which he says yield immediate cognition of objects, and concepts, which yield only immediate cognition of objects. Kant argues that we do not have an intellectual intuition which yields cognition of objects or things as they are in themselves, but only a sensible intuition which yields cognition of objects or things as they appear and only as they appear. Because, he argues, we only have sensible intuition, we need concepts to unify them. And in fact, Kant defines an object as that and the concept of which a manifold of given a sensible intuition is united. The whole line of reasoning is then bound up with the epistemology of the earlier parts of the critique. I happen to think that that epistemology is problematic for reasons I cannot go into here, though I think Kant is a very, very great thinker. My present point is only that in the transcendental dialectic, Kant is advancing critiques of rational psychology, rational cosmology, and rational theology, including his critique of the ontological argument for the existence of God, which are ostensibly intended to offer independent support for the epistemology of the transcendental analytic. To that end, they cannot rely, as I think they do, on the epistemology of the transcendental analytic. To that end, excuse me, Kant can boldly assert that even if a necessary being does exist, we cannot know that it exists. To make good that assertion in the face of the ontological argument, he must have recourse to what he thinks he has established in the transcendental analytic. Kant was undoubtedly aware of this problem, and he continues to advance, to try to advance, 
a counter argument that does not depend on what he thinks is established in the transcendental analytic. What we can call again. We must ask, is the proposition that this or that thing exists an analytic or a synthetic proposition? If it is analytic, the assertion of the existence of this thing adds nothing to the thought of the being. But if we admit, as every reasonable person must, that all existential propositions are synthetic, how can we profess to maintain that the predicate of existence cannot be rejected without contradiction? This is a feature which is found only in analytic propositions. To this, Anselm Descartes too would respond that the proposition of God exists is indeed analytic, for existence, as the argument purports to show, pertains necessarily, but also uniquely, to the very concept of God. Only in thinking of God is it the case that we must think of him as existing, that we cannot think of him as not existing. That's what Anselm and Descartes would say. This particular analytic proposition, God exists necessarily is sui generis. What holds for analytic propositions that do not have God as their sub subject does not hold for analytic propositions that do have God as their subject. Kant calls the proposition God exists, as argued for via the ontological argument, first a mere tautology. Then a few lines later, perhaps in exasperation, a miserable tautology. The proponent of the ontological argument will coolly respond that the proposition God exists is indeed a tautology. Reflection on what is meant by the subject of this sentence will sooner or later reveal that existence is inseparable from it. Moreover, the proposition in its general form, S exists, is only a tautology when the subject S is God. There, ex there exists or is a placida to the east of this building is not a tautology. I exist as not a tautology either. I can think of the placida as not existing. I can think of myself as not existing. That is deco decomposed or annihilated. No contradiction there, none at all. But as Anselm and Descartes both argue, one cannot think of God as not existing. Not that is after thinking through what is meant by the word God. It is of course possible to simply write into one's rules of object the stipulation that exists can never be a predicate of any analytic proposition. But Anselm would want to know why one would make such a stipulation which is not a logical claim, but a metaphysical one, and an ad hoc claim at that, namely, nothing exists of necessity. What's the argument for that, and some would ask. Kant recognizes that his critique of the ontological argument needs to be pressed further. He says that he has found, quote, an illusion that is caused by confusion of a logical with a real predicate. By a real predicate, Kant means a predicate that determines what an object is. <clears throat> and for him, that means to repeat what is bound up with a bodily perception of an object. But though, as I noted above, Kant is often cited with approval by contemporary thinkers as having said that being is not a predicate or that being is a meaningless predicate, Kant grants in passing in this very sentence that being is a logical predicate it is not simply meaningless unless one insists that meaning essentially relies on sense perception, an existence that would render logic and the critique of pure reason too meaningless. Being is not a real predicate, Kant says, because it does not enlarge the concept of the object. Saying that something exists does not tell us what the subject is. At this point, however, the proponent of the ontological argument will find another opponent of it on his side, namely Thomas Aquinas. Thomas would say that Kant's claim here reinforces his own claim that in the case of everything in the world, there is no connection at all between what it is and that it is. In Thomas's language, there's nothing in the world such that its being, its esse, is identical to its essence or its whatness. And that's because there's nothing in the world, not even the world itself, that is characterized by absolutely necessary existence. So Thomas argues, and he does argue. The world and all that is within it is contingent. It can be thought of without the least contradiction as not existent. Only God, who is strictly speaking in, not who is not strictly speaking in the world, but above it, is characterized by absolutely necessary existence. God's existence is inseparable from what he is. God's essay is to be is inseparable from his essentia, his whatness. And that's unique in the case of God, according to Thomas. On this particular point, Thomas and Anselm agree, but Thomas argues to this conclusion in the course of an a posteriori cosmological argument, which takes our experience of worldly entities as its starting point. Anselm reaches his conclusion on the basis of an a priori ontological argument that turns on what is meant by the word God. And so Thomas does not do that. Now, Thomas criticizes Anselm's argument, and we shall consider his criticism shortly. It is, I think, the most interesting and most powerful criticism of Anselm's argument. To bring Thomas in at this point only to note that Kant's claim that the predicate exists does not enlarge our concept of the thing, that is, that it does not contribute to our knowledge of what the thing is, 
bears a close and insufficiently appreciated relation to Thomas's place, claim that in the case of the world and its contents, knowing that these things exist does not contribute to our knowledge of what they are. <clears throat> My point here is not that, uh, or knowing what they are, in the case of con um, concrete things in our world, knowing what they are doesn't mean we know that they are. A white rhinoceros, I might know what that is, to use an example I've used before. And they may have all perished last night due to poaching or something like that. That's going to keep me from knowing what one is. So I can know about them without knowing, I can know about their essence without knowing anything about their essay, Thomas would say. My point uh, here is not that Kant's criticisms of the ontological argument are simply misguided, but that they are inextricable from his peculiar understanding of the way the mind works as this gets sorted out in the early parts of the critique of pure reason. If what he attempts to show there is correct, in particular, that a concept is something serviceable for knowledge only when it is employed to synthesize and unify spatial and temporal intuitions and the empirical data given in these sensible intuitions, then the ontological argument collapses, and along with it, all other attempts of speculative reason to demonstrate the existence of God. So a thoroughgoing defense of rational theology in any of its variations, and some included, uh, would, and, and by the way, variations that would report to show that revelation is not possible, would have to show that Kant's understanding of how and what the human mind can know is defective. Kant's, as for you the word often used today, is agnostic in this matter. Needless to say, that's a tall order and will not be filled today. That is a critique of the critique of your reason, not this afternoon. But in this connection, we should keep in mind that the sustained argument that Kant advances to validate his understanding of the limits under which concepts function has the consequence of establishing a supersensible but unknowable order of things beyond nature, thereby leaves one free to believe certain things about the supersensible that are invulnerable to the criticisms of philosophy and natural science. To quote from the preface of the second edition of the Critique of Pure Reason, I have found it necessary to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. We should also remember that although the ideal of pure reason, that is the concept of God, is rather unceremoniously escorted out the back, so to speak, speculative floor of pure reason, it is shortly afterwards welcomed with great ceremony into the front or practical door of pure reason, that it becomes the central theme of Kant's book, Religion Within the Limits of Reason Alone. Not all who admire Kant's critique of the ontological argument appreciate how intimately connected that very critique is with this whole larger moral, even theological project. Now to Thomas Aquinas' criticism, with which I'll be ending. I prefaced my account of Kant's criticism by summarizing Descartes' version of that argument because Descartes' version is the one that Kant seems to have in mind. I shall now preface Thomas Aquinas' criticism by referring to a statement of Avicenna's, that is, I think, in the background of Thomas's criticism. According to Avicenna, we got him number nine. According to Avicenna, is if it is possible that a divine being exists, then this being must exist. Spinoza makes explicit the reasoning that is implicit in Avicenna's statement summarized in number 10 in your hand there. By the way, I know there's a, there's a teaching that Spinoza's really an atheist. The problem with that is that Spinoza's argument for thoroughgoing determinism in the world presupposes the argument that the world and God are identical and that God is so perfect there could not be variations in what he is in his own essence. So. Uh, one got rid of one thought Spinoza was not quite serious in identifying God with the world and saying he had an ontological argument similar to, uh, to Anselm's that God exists. Uh, one would have to say he's not serious about his determinism either. That's the end of Spinoza because the determinism is essential to Spinoza's critique of religion, among other things. I preface my. Okay. Let's, okay um, so Spinoza's reasoning goes like this. Only three reasons can be given for the non-existence of something. Either it was never made, or it was destroyed, or it is not possible for it to exist. Now, if God does not exist, it cannot be because he was never made. For if God is according to the very concept of God, not for God is according to the very concept of God, not something that could be made. That thing would be greater than he is in some respect or it, however you want to put that. Similarly, if God does not exist, it cannot be because he was destroyed. For all, so according to the very concept of God, he's not something that, if he once existed, could have been destroyed. Therefore, if God does not exist, Spinoza infers, it can only be for the third reason. That is, if God does not exist, it can only be for the third reason. Like a square circle, it is impossible for him to exist. 
From this claim, if God does not exist, it can only be because it is impossible for him to exist, it follows at once. And if it is possible for God to exist, then he must exist. Okay, needless to say, this reasoning of Spinoza rests on the presupposition that reasons can be given both for why existent, existent things do exist and why non-existent things do not exist. I think that this presupposition is reasonable to say the least, but I recognize that it is a presupposition and that it cannot be demonstrated without begging the question. Spinoza's presupposition is apparent to the is tantamount to the claim that being is essentially rational. What is has a reason for why it is, and what is not has a reason for why it is not. Now, some thinkers have tried to show, though of course not rational, demonstrate that being is not essentially rational. Probably the greatest thinker uh, who attempted to do that was Heidegger. And these thinkers cannot be rationally demonstrated to be wrong on this point, again, not without begging the question. So let us say that Spinoza's presupposition, something does not exist, there must be a reason for why it does not exist, that it is not a self-evident axiom, at least a rational postulate. That is a postulate that accords with our reason's natural attempt to make sense of what it considers. We note that the proposition, if it is possible that a God exists, then he necessarily exists, excuse me, if it is possible that God exists, then he necessarily exists, does not immediately generate the proposition God exists. For it remains an open question, as you probably suspected all along, until further reason answers it, it remains an open question whether it is possible for God to exist. It is then precisely the possible existence of God that is at stake. If it is impossible for God to exist, then of course he cannot exist. But if it is possible for God to exist, then he cannot not exist. That is, he must exist, or so Spinoza argues. As does, uh, as, do, um, as does Leibniz and others. Let us now turn to Thomas Aquinas's criticism of the ontological argument. Unlike Kant, uh, Th Thomas addresses Anselm's actual argument. His criticism of the Summa Theologiae is abbreviated, as are many of the arguments in that work, which Thomas, after all, announces in the prologue as, prologue as written, for the instruction, written for the instruction of beginners. A clearer and stronger version of the criticism in the Summa Theologiae can be found in his commentary on the sentences uh, and in Summa, uh, Summa Contra Gentiles. Thomas detects a problem in Anselm's first premise, God is something then which a greater cannot be thought. According to Thomas, it is possible to think that nothing of this sort exists than which a greater cannot be thought. This simple observation is more penetrating than it seems at first, for Thomas is suggesting the possibility that one can always think of something greater than what one has thus far thought of. If so, then the middle term of Anselm's syllogism, something than which a greater cannot be thought, names an impossibility. If whatever can be thought of is such that it's always possible to think of something greater than that, then that middle term is a problem of the same kind as that number than which a greater number cannot be thought. What would that be? If one defined a natural numbers, if one defined X as that number, then which a greater number cannot be thought, then it would turn out not that X does exist, but that X does not exist. For there's no number at any event, not in pre-modern arithmetic, then which a greater number cannot be thought simply by adding a unit to it. Number does not admit of a maximum. Similarly, Thomas suggests, it is possible for one to think that the concept of greatness does not admit of a maximum either. either. In thinking of greater and greater without end, we do not end up thinking of that and which a greater cannot exist. The very finitude of our thought always enables us to think of something greater than the last thing we thought of, something a little wiser, a little more powerful, even a little more providential, and so forth. The problem Thomas detects is that Anselm's formulation could be interpreted as tying a quasi-definition of God as supreme being to our finite, time-bound, discursive cognitive powers. If we define God as something then which a greater cannot be thought, and we discover as a matter of fact that there is nothing then which we cannot think of greater, then it seems that we should be able to infer that God so defined does not exist. The thought experiment Anselm's formulation invites us to engage in seems to lead more easily to atheism than to theism. To this objection, Anselm would certainly respond as follows. I never said that God is something then which a great, nothing greater can be thought by us but that God is something in which a greater cannot be thought, period. Even if we, with our finite intellects, find that we can always think of, we can always think of something greater than the last thing we thought of, this limitation does not hold for an infinite intellect, that is, for a divine intellect, for God, 
if God exists, then he is able to think, excuse me, if God exists, then he is unable to think of anything greater than himself. So God's intellect is perfectly adequate to any object, even when that object is God himself. Anselm's response to Thomas here, as I proposed it, does not logically depend upon the claim that God actually exists, but it does depend upon the claim that God possibly exists. That is the only way Anselm can prevent his argument from careening toward the atheistic conclusion that there is nothing than which a greater cannot be thought. But if Anselm's argument logically presupposes even the possibility of God's existence, then it is invalidated. For as we've seen, it is precisely the possible existence of God that is at issue. Any proof that assumes the possible existence of God assumes the necessary existence of God as well. Anselm might not be silenced by Thomas's criticism. He might reply that something then which a greater cannot be thought is conceivable by us, admittedly only in the abstract and not concretely. But Thomas would then say not only that the more concretely you think of something then which nothing greater can be thought, the easier it becomes to think of something even greater, and then something greater than that, and hence of nothing than which you cannot think of greater. But also that the more abstract you think of something than which nothing greater can be thought, the emptier, the emptier your thinking becomes, and hence the less sure you can be that there's nothing intrinsically problematic in the concept you're entertaining. Anselm's argument, I think, does not prove that God exists. But this argument, more precisely, the reason for, I think it doesn't exist because I think Thomas Aquinas has proved this, so. Uh, is um, refutes it, defeats it. Anselm's argument, and this argument most precise, more precisely, the reason, reasoning that animates it, when considered carefully, brings to the fore what is in the background of the argument, and as I have tried to show, is also intention of the argument, namely the rationality of the inference in the case of God and only of God from his possible existence to his necessary existence. Anselm's tacit assumption, according to Thomas's criticism, the crucial assumption, is that it is possible at least for God to think that something then which nothing greater can be thought even by him. But then this assumption, which necessarily includes the assumption that it is possible for God to exist, destroys the argument. Anselm's argument begs the question, presupposes the very thing that is most at issue, namely the possible existence of God. I note here that Thomas Aquinas would not accept the central features of Kant's criticism. He agrees with Anselm that this proposition, God exists, is of itself self-evident because the predicate is the same as the subject. Thomas, however, adds at once, but because we don't know of God what he is, the proposition God exists is not self-evident to us. Thomas would say in opposition to Kant that existence is most definitely a predicate. It is even a real predicate, not in Kant's sense of being bound up with the features of perception, but in the sense of stating something altogether meaningful about the, about the subject, it exists. To deny, deny this, Thomas would say, is an act of desperation and unworthy of philosophy. Existence is, however, a special kind of predicate in that it does not tell us what the subject is, except uniquely in the case of God. What God is, according to Thomas, is his very act of being. For Thomas, no less than Anselm, God's essence uni uniquely to be, it is uniquely to be. But to justify this proposition, Kant needs an independent argument. Thomas's strongest argument is developed with extensive preparation in his early treatise on being in essence, not in the Summa Theologia, in my opinion. It's not one of the five ways, it has some resemblance to the second way, but it's an independent argument. I gave an argument, lecture on that some time ago. I'm not going to go over it now. If the possible existence of God, this is a curiosity, if the possible existence of God does not imply the necessary existence of God, then Anselm's argument does not beg the question and is invulnerable to Thomas's criticism. If, on the other hand, and as I myself think, the possible existence of God does imply the necessary existence of God, then Anselm's argument does beg the question and is vulnerable to Thomas's criticism. The oddity is that the most powerful critique of Anselm's argument for the existence of God points the way to an argument for the existence of God that aims single-mindedly at establishing the possible existence of God, his necessary existence following as a matter of course. Thomas points to that, but he doesn't develop it. Few contemporary critics of Anselm appreciate the full force of Thomas's criticism, but they know correctly that Anselm assumes the possible existence of God and does not justify this assumption. What few of them recognize, however, is that one great thinker did set out to justify this assumption, and I think he managed to do so by demonstration at length and with extraordinary logical sophistication. That great thinker is Don Scotus. He attempts to demonstrate, to demonstrate 
a possible existence of God because he's convinced that the necessary existence of God fo follows from that as a matter of necessity. The most elaborate version of Scotus's argument for the existence of God occurs in his treatise on the first principle. I invite you to consider it. Thank you.